Today's video is a Q&A and I want to talk about a bunch of different things. Um, some of the questions asked were about film prices, my Leica that's already broken, and a bunch of other things. It's a good excuse to kind of sit here and just chat for a while and answer some of your questions that I got off of Instagram. Someone says, how do you decide which photo to show in a YouTube video? The thing that a lot of people don't know about these YouTube videos is that I show everything and that's what I like about making these videos is I try to show a lot of the time the good and the bad images. I like the idea of revealing everything so that you see my entire process and hopefully for some people out there that's more relatable and I think a lot of people go into a YouTube video with the expectation of I'm about to see the best thing I've ever seen and then they come to my video and it's like I'm literally showing all 10 photos that are on my roll. I like that transparency, I like that process, and it's what I would like to see from other photographers because I think that's the strength of this platform is it's not a place to show your final, most polished thing. It's a place to share the process of taking images. And so I don't really decide most of it goes in. There's times when I'll highlight certain final images and I'll share a final project for the most part, it's everything gets put in there. It's scary to do that with your own work because I know that nobody out there is taking 36 out of 36 photos on a roll and they're all excellent. A lot of the times it takes me 10 rolls to get a photo that I'm happy with, but I like that process and I like that honesty. Someone said, post more videos, please. And this is in here a lot. I used to post significantly more videos. I There was one month I posted think eight videos in one month. And that was the time that my channel grew the most ever. I think I did maybe 25 or 30,000 new subscribers that month. But doing that is extremely demanding. And I'm in more of a period where I'm happy with where my channel's at. I'm not looking for more growth in the channel. I like where it's at. And I'd rather post two videos a month that I care about and that means something to me rather than trying to crank out eight of them for the sake of growing the channel more. There's a lot of topics I could do that would make really easy, quick videos that I know would do a lot more views, but I don't know, at this point in my life, I'm just more fulfilled and more content with putting out two videos a month that I know are of decent quality and decent substance. Someone asks, any passion projects you're working on right now? I think I have two sets of photos that I'm really excited about right now. One is the Morro Bay Rock series that I started as a self-assignment on this channel. I've really been enjoying working on that, trying to find as many perspectives, lighting situations, and like surfaces of this one incredibly touristy landmark that's somewhat defined this town. And it's been really enjoyable because I love visiting there. I love camping there. I think it's an unpretentious set of photos. It's just about this one touristy landmark and trying to find as many perspectives of it as possible. It just feels good while making it. Another project that I'm really excited about right now is the photos I've been making in the Outer Banks, which I've documented on this channel. I've been going there every single year for quite a long time now. And the images I come back with feel really special to me. There's something special about the light out there that I've really just enjoyed documenting, and I love being by the water. I've met so many amazing people out there, local photographers who are all incredibly talented, and I can't wait for my next trip. How often do you develop and scan your own rolls versus using a dedicated lab? I've stopped developing my film myself completely. I've handed that off to a lab for quite a few years. Occasionally here and there I'll develop a roll for fun, but I think for me, I just don't want to spend all the time developing myself anymore, especially when I come back with like 20 rolls. I'd rather just drop it off, have it done professionally, know that it's done right, know that my imperfections won't have any effect on my images. And just when you spend like, you know, thousands of dollars to do these trips, make the photos, I'd rather just have that peace of mind and have it done professionally. I've also found that with darkroom printing, it's a lot harder to hide the flaws of imperfect developing. Like if you get little spots or dust that sticks to your film, all that stuff just becomes like magnified in a darkroom print because digital scanners can remove that stuff really well, but it's all there in a darkroom print. So 
for a long time now, I've just dropped it off at a lab that does dip and dunk developing, which is super clean developing. And yeah, it just gives me that peace of mind. But I do still scan all of my own film on my friend Linus's Frontier Scanner. And when I'm not using that, I'm at home printing all the rest of it and then scanning those prints. Somebody asks, how has your experience been with the Lights Minolta CL? It's been bittersweet, I wanna say, because I really like using the camera. I am returning it to the seller because it is also broken. On bulb mode, the shutter speed sticks for like an extra five or 10 seconds when you release the shutter. So a 15 second exposure turns into like a 30 second one. The rangefinder patch uh, is pretty much misaligned and it came that way from the day I got it. And there's one more issue. Oh, and the camera has also just kind of been repainted in a cheap way. Like there's a bunch of paint that's chipping off that was obviously redone in a very cheap way. All of that stuff is kind of unacceptable since this was supposedly recently CLA'd. And if you have a CLA'd camera, the shutter shouldn't stick and the rangefinder patch should not be as crooked as it is. So yeah, I'm returning that one, but I probably will end up buying something similar, if not the same camera again. Linus just sent me this in here somehow. Didn't even know you could do that. Thank you for the question, Linus. This question is in here a lot. Do you consider shooting more digital because of the film prices? And this is a tricky one to answer because yes, I've been shooting more digital recently for a lot of commercial projects where film just doesn't make sense. It doesn't fit the timeline. It doesn't fit the budget. And I don't mind shooting digital when I have to. An image is an image at the end of the day and what you put in front of the camera is 99 times more important than what it's shot on. But there's a lot of questions in here in a similar vein about is film getting too expensive? Would you switch to digital because of the prices? And it's a tough one to answer because film is what I started photographing with. It's what I know and love. It's what I'm comfortable with. And yeah, from the first day I picked up a photography camera, it's always been film. I still really enjoy the process. I really enjoy darkroom printing my images and I like the look that I get out of them. But I have, as you may have noticed, kind of shifted focus on this channel a little bit over the past few years. I used to make a lot more videos that were about gear and film itself, different film stocks you could try, that kind of thing. And more recently, and maybe this is also why I don't upload as much anymore because they're much harder to make, but I upload videos that are now just about the photography process and about going out and taking photos and about my process with making images, what I think ends up working out to be a good image and how I got there. That kind of thing is far more interesting to me now. Back when I started shooting film many years ago, a pro pack of 120 was $32 for Portrait 400 for five rolls, $32 at B&H. And I remember that back then I was in college it was really expensive for me back then and really hard to attain. And I remember doing everything I could to shoot that one roll a week when I was starting out and to justify or to pay for that film cost. And now film has just gotten so much more expensive. And I know that to me as a college kid back then, with what it costs now, it would be completely unattainable, which is super unfortunate that it's had to become that way and that the prices have gone up that much. And that's not to say I'm not grateful for film. I'm still super thankful that it's even still around and that there's still people at the factories like working to actually make it possible. And that Kodak is still even selling it today is amazing, but the prices are really high. And that part is extremely unfortunate, I think. I shot myself in the foot a little bit by saying like last month or something that I'd be dropping this video with Porsche. And that's still happening, but probably more looking like the end of August. And I am so excited to share that one because it really was a dream job for me. How do you come up with a photography project idea? I've always wanted to make something meaningful. That's a really tough one. And I think for me, anything that I've made that I've considered meaningful has just come from years of taking photos and figuring out what worked and what I liked. The ideas certainly haven't come from sitting behind the computer and trying to think of things that way. I come up with ideas that I like when I'm out taking photos, when I'm out interacting with people, when I'm out in nature. 
that's when my mind is thinking about ideas and that's when I come up with what I think could be something meaningful. I spend a lot of time behind the computer editing and trying to think of projects, but I've never found anything super meaningful that way, I would say. I'm most inspired when I'm out actually just taking pictures, even if it's without a specific intention, when I'm just away from my phone and distractions and the internet and I'm just walking around somewhere with my camera or without my camera, just walking, that's when I kind of find myself having nice conversations with myself about ideas and projects and photos. Someone asks, hey, I've been thinking about printing. What advice would you have about starting out with that? If you don't know, darkroom printing is the process of taking your negative and exposing it on light sensitive paper. And it's this alternative to scanning your film. It creates beautiful results because the paper and the film were made by the same people and they're kind of made for each other. It's an alternative to editing your photos digitally. And although it's not efficient, not cost effective, and it takes a ton of time, it is a really satisfying process. But it can be tricky to get into because there's not a lot of new equipment being made for this process. But if you're trying to get into it, what I would suggest is look for a used and larger from a place like a school or another photographer who used to print many years ago. The market for these things is kind of really strange. There's some people who will try to sell a good and larger for like $2,000 and then you have some schools that are trying to give them away for free and nobody's taking them. So you can get this stuff really cheap if you look in the right places. And if you're just starting out, I would recommend developing in a drum, not using a tabletop processor, but developing color prints in a drum or in trays. There's really like relatively affordable ways to get into it. You can get a whole setup going for like maybe $200 if you look in the right places and if you take the time to slowly collect the pieces of equipment. What I've noticed is like, there's a lot of this stuff being given away for free when people find it and they don't even know what it is or they just don't know what to do with it. If you decide one day, oh, I'm gonna start darkroom printing and you buy everything off eBay that day, you're gonna spend a ton of money on equipment that you can really come across for relatively cheap if you just take the time to look around at estate sales, Craigslist, whatever it is, that stuff is out there for cheap if you look in the right places and it's a really fulfilling process. Besides YouTube and Instagram, what are ways you get photography work? This is unrelated to the sponsor of the video, but I think something extremely underrated for photographers is their website. It is such a valuable way to curate your photography work exactly the way that you want. And Instagram to me is kind of the way to have people find my work, but the way to present your work to those people is through a good website that you curated with exactly the images that you want and that's exactly laid out the way that you want. I know that I personally spend a ton of time looking at the websites of photographers that I admire. It's so much more intentional than Instagram and you can find so much incredible work that way. I also think that back to your question, anybody who is considering hiring photographers for their work, finds them maybe through Instagram, but ultimately I think they hire them based off the work on their website. So I do think that is an incredibly important way to present your work if you're not already doing that. And I actually wanna make a full video about highlighting different websites that I like, maybe just looking at them together. Do you spend much time on Instagram? The algorithm gives me too much similar work. This is a really interesting topic. And I will admit, I spend way too much time on Instagram and I can consciously feel how it affects me. But it's tough as somebody who wants to be a photographer that's getting jobs. It feels like it's kind of required to be sharing work on there as a way to put yourself out there and get your work noticed. So it's a really tricky relationship. The algorithm gives me too much similar work is the part of this question that I'm really interested in because it's absolutely true. Once you start sort of engaging with a certain style of work, it definitely delivers you more of that. And also it tends to favor these kind of really bright, striking images that are visually really strong, but might not go much further than that. And that's not to say there's anything wrong with an image that's purely just beautiful visually, but I do think it's a little bit dangerous to get too caught up in Instagram and have that be the only place that you're getting 
your inspiration from. I think it's truly impossible to make something unique if you're constantly consuming images elsewhere. And that's something that I've been trying to do more of recently is be more conscious about what I'm consuming and try to avoid just the infinite scroll of Instagram where you're just mindlessly taking in a lot of work that you might not even care about that much. I think just taking in a lot of images through Instagram that way subconsciously will affect what you're interested in, even if it's not something you intentionally think about. If you're constantly consuming other people's work, I think subconsciously it can be really difficult to make something that feels truly unique and truly yourself. This has been running for quite a while, so I'm gonna wrap it up here. Thank you guys for all the lovely questions and thank you for watching the video. Finally, I wanna give a huge thank you to Squarespace for being the sponsor of this video. Squarespace is an incredible all-in-one website building platform that you can use to build your photography portfolio online. I've been using Squarespace for so many years now and they've made it so easy to get a website up and running with my photography. So if that sounds like something you're interested in, you can hit the link in my description for a 14 day free trial of Squarespace. And when you're ready to launch, go to squarespace.com slash Willem for 10% off your first purchase of a website or a domain. I'll see you guys next week with another video. Thank you so much for watching. Peace.